from the Katsukian Studios in Memphis, Tennessee, it's I Conversation. Elliot Perry, otherwise known as Sox. Man, thank you. How you guys doing? Mr. Earl the Pearl Monroe. Hey, thank you. Nice to be with you guys. Glad to have Mr. Allen Houston. Trying to stay warm up here in, in New York. I hear you. Personality extraordinaire, Mr. Scoop Jackson. I appreciate the encore. Mr. Michael Ray Richardson. What's up, man? Glad to be here, brother. A three-time NBA All-Star. The one, the only, Detlef Shrimp. All right, Larry, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be on the show. I Conversation. I Conversation. I Conversation. From North Carolina, number 41, Sam Perkins. Sam Perkins pops out, gets the open jumper over Vandaway. Slammed by Perkins. Perkins in a three-point play here down the stretch. Aguirre double-teamed in the corner underneath. Perkins with the slam. Oh, great reverse slam by Perkins. They cut him loose. Perkins with the next one. I go work like a doctor. When I rock the mic, you got to like the way I operate. I make miracles happen just for rapping. I'm so Welcome to I Conversation. I am Larry Robinson. And I am Jay. J to the C. Jay What's to happening, C. lady? I am so excited to be back in the studio. We're going to blow the block up and have some conversations with some icons that are going to be amazing. Well, that's all a part of our new season. It you is. know, our new season is going to be built around topics. We're going to address topics. And our first series is going to be about race and sports, man. We're going to dig in deep in the area of race and sports, talking to former players, recent players, as well as maybe we bring in a couple people to kind of sit in with us and uh, conduct some of these conversations with uh, these sports icons. JC? We are at an interesting spot in sports where the conversations are no longer sticking to sports. They're getting kind of hard, so we're going to look at them with uh, some humor, if we can, and really dig into all of it. As we're evolving into this new format, really being able to dig into topics and address topics and really go there with some of these iconic figures. We're really going to be getting into the humanity of sports, that we're going to be tackling issues that are difficult to talk about, but that are being talked about on a basic level already. There's got to be understanding if we're going to come together, and we are definitely coming together to have those conversations with some people that you already know. People like Sam Perkins. Well, you know, that's right. We got Sam Perkins. For many people who may not know, Sam Perkins won an NCAA championship, New York Hall of Fame, gold medalist, Olympic gold medalist, played in three different NBA championships, highly respected member of the NBA family. Sam is involved heavily in Special Olympics. Yep. He's actually the pole mark, which is basically the president of the Fort Worth Cap Alpha Psi yep. chapter yep. down there. Sam is doing some phenomenal work going all over the world representing the NBA, working with the guys over at NBA Cares. Sam Perkins coming up after the break. Hey, this is your guy, D.C., Funky Politics. We're back. A brand new season, brand new shows, brand new guests. We're going to do it just right, right here on the Kazookian Network. Riffin' on Jazz. This next gentleman we're talking about has an unforgettable voice. My sugar is so refined. Jazz was the happiest. Yeah, since the way went to my school. Oh, really? Yes, he's not an alum because he didn't graduate. He has some gigs to do. <laughs> Griffin on Jazz. On the Kazookian Network. Part of this funky politics. Neighborhood Connect. Blues in the Basement. Griffin on Jazz. Best in Blue. Kazookian. K U D Z U K I A N. I conversation. I conversation. I conversation. I conversation. All right, stop. Collaborate and listen. I sit back with my brand new invention. Something grabs a hold of me tightly. We have an amazing guest for you today. Big Smooth. I Conversation. Big Sam Perkins. What's up, Sam? How y'all doing, man? Thanks for having me. I would say that anybody that slept on you in the paint got woke real quick. <laughs> Stay woke. <laughs> Absolutely. Stay woke. What's True. going on with you, Sam? Right now, I've been flowing between uh, New York and Dallas a lot. I'm from New York, of course. 
Oh, uh, you you can't and, tell. Uh, you can't tell. You you sure can't tell Hall with of the fame, accent. New New York. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I've been flowing back and forth and uh, doing, still doing what I do, man. I'm so involved in so much uh, community service work and uh, some things that uh, are still with the NBA, and I've okay. uh, just been trying to uh, maintain that. And of course, the thing that got me busy is this fraternity thing. I don't. I know you know about it, but I'm president of my chapter. Okay. And uh, which chapter been, is that? It's the Fort Worth alumni chapter. Our undergrad is TCU Epsilon, you know. Nice. So okay. we uh, we just been doing this. It's been kicking my butt though, but I enjoy it because the parallels of what I do, uh, you know, from the start. So um, just giving back to the community and working on Thanksgiving this time. We gave out like 250 turkeys last year. So oh, we worked on 250 again. So okay. it, it gives you kind of responsibility, but it's a it's an organization of men just helping young men trying to achieve, and that's what we do. So Cap Alpha Psi in the house. We got a new, right. uh, so you know you guys got to recognize. So we got two noobs on the line. So and a white girl, <laughs> <laughs> nice little Jewish Everything. white girl. That's, that's, that's the crimson and cream right there. That's what I'm talking about. I, Noob Nation is is a very strong. I love it. I love it. Well, listen, we're gonna come back with Sam on the other side. And uh, kind of get into really the details and what's going on. And eventually, we're going to ask him about, you know, what's going on. Are the brothers in the NBA going to take a knee? They're going to turn their shirts inside out? What's, what, what does he think is going to happen as a form of protest in the NBA? But we'll be right back. Sports, artivism, best in blue, funky politics, blues in the basement, neighborhood connect, riffin' on jazz, on the Kazookian Network. I conversation, I conversation, I conversation. You've been hit by, you've been hit by a smooth We are back with Big Smooth Sam Perkins, who is a national champion. He is a gold medal Olympian. He is uh, heavy into the Special Olympics. And I would really like to know about the 84 Olympics and kind of what the climate was like, given that it was a boycotted uh, Olympics in uh, Los Angeles. Here we go with Russia again. Uh, Yeah, with some collusion going on. Well, you know, it was... uh I mean, it was a cool event because, you know, like you said, Russia boycotted, which is fine. We wouldn't go without it anyway. We wouldn't go on without it anyway. But the team came up comprised of a lot of guys that you would know. Leon Wood. Yes, sir. Wayman Tisdale, my man. Michael Jordan. Yes, sir. Steve Alfred, Vera Fleming. Alvin Robertson, Pat Ewing, Chris Mullen. I mean, we had so Hold many Hold on, guys. man. You, you and, just named uh, off the first 10 <laughs> picks of the 1984 uh, NBA draft, man. Uh, of yeah. which uh, Sam Perkins went right behind Jordan, who he played with at UNC. Right. For those who have been sleeping, time to be woke. <laughs> I'm just oh, Wake him up. I wake him up, JC. I was, I, was, I, was, I was awake. I was awake for that. <laughs> what was that like, right. Sam? What was what was it like hearing your name called, walking up there, seeing David Stern? Take us through that. Let me tell you, we since the Olympics were going on at the time. I mean, long, long story short, we 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 had to uh, beat out seventy five guys. You know, there were seventy five players that uh, tried out in, in in Bloomington, Indiana. Right. And, wow. uh, what, what happened was Bobby Knight territory. Uh, Bobby Knight was the coach. I know. And uh, so we we finally made it down to the to the twelve, or I think it was thirty till twelve or something like that. And uh, he let us go back to graduate and all those who had to graduate. But when we came for the draft, he wouldn't let us go. Yeah, because you couldn't be professional practice. and play in the Olympics at that point. Is that is that correct? Well, we no, we could, ah. but. We we were drafted. We were drafted uh, while the Olympics practices were going on. Ah! So we were in Bloomington, and he wouldn't let us go. Oh, so man. we all those who were eligible for the draft, he let us go, and we had to go to a radio station to find out where we went. 
Oh, so we wow. Never, we, never, we never got to do the, the stage thing except for you, you saw people like maybe Barkley and I want to say Elijah Wan, right. Bowie, but you never saw the next anybody after that. When we finished practice, we all jumped in cars and we went to the nearest radio station. And so when we got into the radio station, we found out, you know, you know we kind of knew where we were going to go, but we weren't sure. Right. Because, you know, they, they pick you and then they might have traded you right. or slide you up or whatever. So when we got there, you know, Michael had went to Chicago, I had went to Dallas, and then, you know, everybody else filled in. So um, the guys like Vern Fleming may not have known where they were going. Or, right. Uh, uh, what's his name? Jeff Turner or right. Concat. Yeah, these guys didn't know where they were going. I see uh, Alvin Robinson. So we all got there and we figured out that, you know, you went to the Dallas Mavericks. So we never really had a, a draft. We never saw that David Stern handshake. Or oh, wow. Like that. What a bummer. Listen, this is. But he uh, wouldn't let us go. He wouldn't let us go. So mm-hmm. Well, you know, Bobby, Bobby Knight, man, being from Louisville, Kentucky, I, I developed a, a healthy hate. For Indiana University. <laughs> Listen, this is R and R I conversation, and today we have Big Smooth from University of North Carolina, Tar Heel, NCAA champion, NBA player, Sam Perkins. Sam, talking about the Olympics. What happened with Charles Barkley, man? Was he really? Because I heard he was killing it doing doing the okay. trials. So, you know, like I told you, we had to try out. We all, you know, we had to try out against guys like Chuck Person, um, Dawkins. I mean, Danny Manning. We had everybody there. Everybody you can think of, you know, in their in their region that was there. So they had the top 75. So you had a guy, Charles Barkley, uh, Antoine Carr, Xavier McDaniel. And these guys, you know, I had to go. My first my first guy I had to go against was Chuck Person. I had to get, I had to make um uh, had two bounces to get to the hoop, you know, from the wing. Uh-huh. So, and then at another basket, you had Charles Barkley. It was a rebounding shoot and box out. Well, <clears throat> when he got to that basket, <laughs> Barkley, Barkley was killing him. So Barkley was throwing people around, and he would, after he'd do something like crazy, he was always pointing out, now, Bobby Knight is in a tower, so he's looking, you know, all around. He can see all the courts. Right. So he was in, he was like in a tower, like a, you know, you like a my lifesaver. Uh huh. So he was in a tower, so he was looking at everybody, and he would all and Bark would always point. Say, did you see me? Did you see that? Did you see that? <laughs> <laughs> like, of course he did. You know he is not so, a role so model. Barkley, Barkley would always do something and then look at coach and yell out. So the other time uh, he was. Uh, uh, I think we were entering the gym and we were walking in and he told Bobby Knight, he said, man, you, I love those kicks. Can you give me some? So, you know, Bobby Knight is one of these guys, like, you stand off as nobody wants to talk to him. The way he looks, he doesn't really say anything. He doesn't really give you small talk. So Barkley was always on him. Barkley's always talking to him. And he was like, I don't know. Now, at this point, I'm like, Barkley, it's crazy. So he was doing all types of things like that to get on um, coach's nerve. Wow. Well, come seven thirty in the morning, we had three. We, we, now we tried out three times a day: once uh-huh. in the morning, once in the afternoon, and one at night. This one particular time, we had cuts. The first cut, and it was like three day, two days later. And the first name he called out at seven thirty in the morning. I'm eating my cereal, and he said. Charles Barkley. <gasps> These names that you're about to hear will not make you know, will go home. Wow. And we thought Barkley was doing everything because he was beating cats down and, and 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 just just doing whatever he's supposed to do. Right. And he said Charles Barkley. The first name was going to be cut to go home was Charles Barkley. And well, now we didn't know if we were going home because if he was doing that bad, we must have been doing worse. So he went home and. Uh, I don't know if he really wanted to make the team. Everybody speculated that he didn't want to make the team or just or Bobby Knight just didn't want him on the team because he was so rambunctious or just had a he, – he just stood out. I mean, Barkley could have made that team. Easily. I, I believe Easily. that wasn't, you know, uh, Bobby Knight's uh, play type of player. What do you remember well, about the Olympics? We played exhibition games. I was looking forward. We just – now we just – 
we just got drafted, so we rookies, kind of rookies, and we were the last amateur team to play. So when I, I remember playing against the pros, Larry Bird, Alex English, uh, these type of guys every night, and it was it was that was my highlights because I wanted to see. I mean, I looked up to Alex English. Of course, he's Man, a new guy you know, right now, right, and right. Larry Bird, Parrish. So when we get to these games, we're playing against the pros, and you want to see how you do. And so we have beaten them. We have beaten them several times, and that was a good thing. So it, it, it gave us more confidence, boosted up our, our our play a little bit, and everybody was thinking that we were going to run through the uh, Olympics. So if we beat the pros, we're going to beat the we're going to be all these other uh, countries. But that. That was a great experience because, I mean, I love playing with that team because you got friendships out of there. You got, remember, I remember my man, Wayman, passed away. Wayman yeah. Fisdale. And uh, we hung out and got to know, you, you got to know guys that you normally never heard of. Right. Or, I mean, you never, not never played with. Right. But you right. heard of from different conferences and things of that nature. Pat Ewing and, and Alvin Robertson and these guys. And so you saw the, like, the top crop from from different states, from different uh, universities, and we just we just had a good time. That team was real close, and uh, we got to know each other. And when we got into the village in L.A., it was all over. I mean, it was it was a good thing. We were just ready for everybody. Now we we didn't we didn't we blew out some teams, but some other teams other than Russia that wasn't there. Uh, Germany was probably the, uh, was the was the, was in Canada was one of the teams that we struggled with. Wow. Listen, this is r and I Conversation, and we're talking with Sam Perkins of NBA fame, NCAA fame, as well as an Olympic gold medalist. And we'll be right back. You've been hit by, you've been hit by a smooth kazooki. And we are back with Sam Perkins, who attended the University of North Carolina with Michael Jordan. And what I really want to know, Oh, given, don't forget uh, about James Worthy, I'm man. not forgetting don't about James, James Worthy. Worthy. Big, big game James I now. I can't forget James Worthy. Um, <laughs> but given the recent NCAA uh, investigation about classes, what were classes like at that point in time? Were athletes invested in education and playing sports, or was it... I mean, the one and done didn't exist. Yeah. No. Um, well, all I know, I can only speak for Carolina, but we were engaged or uh, my teammates were engaged because um, we, I mean, it was just a way to stay eligible and stay on top of each other. And then we had, we had guys, I guess, like you just mentioned, James Worthy. Uh, he was a year ahead of me. So the guys that were ahead uh, always were making making us accountable to make sure we went to went to class or so got up to go to school. So James Worthy was my um, my uh, sweet my my roommate rather, and um, so he would make sure that I would get up. And uh, Matt Doherty had a uh, like a Jimmy Braddock, so he was ahead as well. So we had people to make sure that we were went to class, and then on top of that. Our teachers were notified if we weren't in our seats that mm-hmm. you know they would get a, they would call the office and say you know Sam Perkins wasn't at school at class today so the coaches would know automatically so um, uh. it was the, the lifestyle in, at Carolina was was the best four years I had because it, you, know, you grew up you know you knew you met a lot of more people I was from New York and I saw a lot of people from the from the South was I mean it- I saw signs. I saw signs of KKK when I went home with uh, guys from, like, Goldsboro, North Carolina, something like that. So I'm in the Deep South, and I've never seen that before. Yeah, and they're speaking right. that lightly. They just pass, They just look at it and pass by. I look at it like, yo, why are we going this way? Because I just saw that KKK sign. <laughs> yeah, let's, 180 like, like, yeah, bro, why are we going this way? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, so that that's the kind of mentality I had. But, you know, you learned a lot. And uh, going to school, um, I mean, school was after one. It was the hardest thing for me because I wasn't I had the best track record of going to class in, in New York. But... 
you get acclimated and um, with Coach Smith, who was you know, who, who was the guy there, right. our, our dear coach. He was more or less like you know, um, just get adjusted, fill yourself out, find your way, get interested in all the things on campus, and then you know, t- uh, you go to school, but you're actually playing basketball for for a hobby, you know. So when you put it that way, you were determined to get that degree, and so a lot of uh, all of us were accountable, but at the same time, we had our fun, and you know, you made your mistakes and grow up, but. So, you know, that so, basketball court so, was our place. place so let me together. ask you real quick: did did you did you experience any issues on campus um, in between the different schools? You know, North Carolina is a very highly educated because of the amount of institutions of for, uh, college institutions in the state. I think it's more than any other state in the union. Was there ever any racial issues that took place on campus? Being so young, you may not have known racism ever took took place you know you, you never had a confrontation where it was just white and black um there was of course you know blacks dated white girls and 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 vice versa so when you see that i mean you may get a stare or here and there or something like that and it, it was more predominantly happening um if it did happen it would happen in the in the clubs or the social places where we we went out because mm-hmm. it comes mostly the black guys from the Carolina basketball team or the football team uh, hanging out with white girls in the clubs or the social places where we went. So, right. you know, it probably was some tension there with, with, with some, some of the white fraternities and things of that nature, but um, I actually never really experienced it until, you know, you got on the road somewhere and you went to a, a spot where, where, you know, where blacks and whites you know, blacks don't accompany, you know, frequently, but at the same time, I mean, you had a little tension there, but I never really had a confrontation, but but back at that time... Ain't no ain't too many was, people running up on a 6'9", brother, then, you know. <laughs> but I think, I think what you said a minute ago, coming from New York, where obviously as a black man, you know racism exists and, and you know of the KKK and you come to the South and realize that these folks are still organized and so it, it's not somebody that you're going to run into here or there it's the potential of running into a mob of people like what just happened in in charleston so right, charlottesville? Right. Well, the, charlottesville yeah, yeah that's what i meant i was i was conscious of it I, so for some reason my guys since they were from there they were used to it but like you said i'm from i'm, I'm from new york and it's like I'm always conscious every time we go somewhere. I'm like, why are we going here? You know what I mean? Right. They were like, man, just come on. You know. So I was always on the on the edge, and right. so I, I I just wanted to make sure that things were good and things were calm. But you, I didn't know about racism racism as much as they did until you know, because I'm when I saw KKK, you know, that tells me you know wh- why are we going that way. But you know. You, you get you get informed and you get you first you go along and get along I guess right thing. This is R and R I conversation and we're speaking with UNC <laughs> UNC Tar Heel former UNC Tar Heel Sam Perkins. I think that that's part of the problem though is is the going along and getting along and I don't think in this country. Um, obviously, it's becoming apparent, apparent in sports that going along and getting along is how we've gotten to here. So we've got Kaepernick, who's been blackballed, um, obviously, white from the ball. NFL. Absolutely whiteballed. <laughs> um, and, and, and owners telling players how they can protest. Do you think that will carry into the NBA more predominantly this year? Well, let me, let me tell you first. This is probably the first time... Um, Politics and racism and being white ball, black ball has has been more prevalent than anything. I mean, well, it's, it's happened before, but we I wasn't around to see it. It happened in the NBA when uh, back in the '60s with uh, Spencer Haywood yeah. and the black yeah. black players back then, um, when they were locked out of their games, if they knew he was the star player, you know, and he came late, they would never let him into the gym, as he was telling. So. I mean, it's it, it, every. I always think everything recycles, 
and this is recycling to a point where they're not going that far, but it's it's coming to a point where when you get political and you get people like people in office and trickle down, and ever since uh, President Obama left, it, uh, it opened up the floodgates for all this lowering the bar and having excuses to do this, these type of things now. And I don't understand why Kaepernick, because of the fact that he just kneeled, and everybody understands, he, everybody knows what he did it for. Mm-hmm. But they changed the narrative to make it to to a point where you know they they just limiting to limiting black players or people of color to say things and get things out off their chest because I believe it's just one of those things where, you know, some people just don't like or disagree. So they change the narrative. And when you change the narrative and you have things like in Charlottesville, and it's going to be happening soon, I guess it's going to repeat itself today or something like that on campuses where they can just come out and say whatever they want. And that's why I say it's, it's, since since I've been around, it's been so prevalent now where people can come out of the woodworks and white supremacists can say what they want and uh, and it's now it's almost a normal thing and everybody's doing it in so many ways in their own way which is maybe affects affects everybody because everybody's talking about it right you, even, we, even if it's not around me you have people who who who's thinking to do what they want to do and and you're not conscious of it real quick before we go to the break Sam as a basketball player, you live somewhat in a cocoon, and and you know pretty much the people that are around you right. kind of help, kind of keep the environment safe. At what point did you realize that, you know, as the Jay Z song goes, you know, rich, you know, brown, whatever, you still are considered or treated like, you know, less than, you know, the status quo. So. So at what point did, did, did you see that, wait a minute, man, it doesn't matter. It, it's all about my humanity or the humanity of people that look like me. You got to go back some more then. You have to go back to college where college programs, they make all this money. Yep. And the, the argument was, should you pay players? Because they go into school, you have players who are amateurs playing football or basketball, and they broke as a joke. Mm-hmm. And so you kind of see the the hierarchy, hierarchy of who's in charge, basically. You know, I mean, and it trickles down from football, basketball, to football, and even into the pros. And as you can tell in the NFL, you have a you have an owner who's saying, don't kneel or you're going to get cut. And those type of, that mentality, and with football players and black players, African-American players, that, that messed with your mentality again because it brings out another side that you thought was, I thought this owner was on my side. I thought this was okay. I thought I was more than just an employee. You know, right. I thought I was more than that. But now I'm property. And yeah. it, right. it, it, it just, it, the mentality, it just comes in your sight. There's a brother, I can't remember what football team he was on, but he, I think someone called him the N-word. And he was saying that, I mean, repeatedly. repeatedly. And so some some players. Excuse me. I, I was I was some, affirming you. Yes, yeah, some players, some players can handle it, but there's a lot of players when they hear that word, they they go off. So, I mean, it's race baiting and all these type of things can. I mean, it can trickle down into your mentality, and when you go out there and play, and somebody say the wrong thing, it can happen to me. It can happen to you in a restaurant. It can happen anywhere in a store on a. In a bus or somewhere and it's just it's, it's just it's just coming out to the point where now um you, you see it a lot but it started back it starts back in schools and yep. and the mentality now because the the younger players now don't have any conscience of what the re- repercussions are so i believe when we came up out of north carolina like i said i was always conscious and if if i was if somebody if something happened i probably would have snapped because I only know one way what to do. Right. But people around me were were educated enough to, to handle it. But I was probably that one guy that like today said if I was called the N word so many times, you gonna go go to your room and think about it and and next thing you know, if somebody hits you again with it, uh anything can happen. So it's it's almost it's it's almost to a point where it's getting almost 
dangerous to the point and with nobody saying anything and nobody being accountable for themselves it's just gonna it's it's it's, it's gonna come out something's gonna happen and I, I don't want it to happen but something eventually is gonna happen this is our and our i conversation you were speaking with former nba great sam perkins sam's dropping the knowledge telling everybody about some of his experiences come back last segment right here on i conversation Artivism, best in blue, funky politics, blues in the basement, neighborhood connect, riffing on jazz, on the Kazookian Network. And we are back with Renaissance Center, Renaissance man, Sam Perkins. <laughs> Um, NBA great Sam Perkins. Put some respect really on his fun. name. I mean, we're talking really about you fun. played in Put some that. respect on his I name. I put the respect on the name. We're I talking did. about the guy who, if you wanted an and one, you had to be bleeding on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Does that bother you as much as it bothers me to hear nah. all these guys yell and one? <laughs> nah, that's, that's a good one, though. I never heard that one. No, nah, y'all should have to. So they should have to take a lap for that because that's just... Well, listen, listen, listen. I, I, I got a that. question. I got a question for Sam. And my question is this. We were talking uh, in the break about Colin Kaepernick. Is Colin Kaepernick this generation's Muhammad Ali? He's a combination of Jim Brown back in the day and uh, Muhammad. And I, uh, the reason why I say that is because Muhammad kicked some knowledge and so much happened to him. Like they did. They took away Colin's, uh, you know, football. They took his rights, uh, Muhammad Ali rights away from, uh, from uh, stripped him from everything he, he, he did in boxing. Uh, he went to jail. Mm-hmm. But Jim Brown was more like a guy who was trying to make everybody understand from a, make, you know, think. Uh, with, with Muhammad Ali, he talked a lot. And you had to be a good listener to understand what he was doing because white people just, just, just disliked him so much with the disdain that they want. To well, wait a minute him. now. Uh, you can't, you can't just sure go there with him. white people. We sure Can- loved him when he stopped talking, though, didn't we? Well, <laughs> white folks forgot what? that Muhammad Ali was an advocate and and a staunch. But, you know, the, the, the challenge I have is that you have a lot of African Americans during that time because of his religion right, that, right, that right. did not support him. One of them being Thurgood Marshall. One of them being Kareem. No, Thurgood Marshall did not support Muhammad Ali. That's why he recused himself from the Supreme Court ruling. He recused that himself is, because because he did not true. agree with his religion. Yep. So so you had a lot of African Americans who did not support. And I see that now with Colin Kaepernick and the whole issues around protesting. You still have brothers watching NFL. I yep. I've 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 blacked out. I'm sorry, I gotta say it. I've blacked out on the NFL. Right. Me too. So, right, but, so, you know, I, I, I am too a little bit because, but let me let me go back to Muhammad. Muhammad made white people think about what they were doing. And, you know, even though, like he I said. He was very eloquent at it, too. Yeah, he was, and he was pretty. Yeah, and he <laughs> and he and when he did that, they they enjoyed him, too. They liked him, too, because he was, he had a flair with him. With Colin Kaepernick, I mean, it it didn't even go that far. All he was he was trying to do was was let people know that Black Lives Matter. Those the same people that they talk about died for the flag and all that. These these people that you that you saw and justly you know wrong uh, died as well. Was with that flag as well. Yep. So I don't understand what what the what the problem was. They, now they keep saying. Now they got a narrative saying. Well, you can kneel anytime you want, but just don't do it here. But that's his platform. Right. You know, that was his platform to, to let people know what things were going on. So kneeling for the flag is, I don't think it was unjustly wrong, but they kneel at any time. They kneel any time. But the, this is the kicker. I'm going to tell you about this. Think about this. When the national anthem is played, and I've been to games, you've been to games too, and if they so... If he disrespected the flag that much by kneeling, and they want you stand attention, 
What about all the people that walking around the stadium? <laughs> Thank you. On their, on their cell phones. Right. Drinking beer at food, concessions. Getting food. Right. Trying to get to their seats. Nobody stops. I ain't seen nobody stop while they while they trying to get to the while they're in the arena. Now you outside parking a car. That's a whole different thing. But if you are inside the arena, I don't see nobody shut down the concession stands. Mm-hmm. I don't see nobody. I, I even seen cops on the phone. So yep. I don't even. Don't get me. All right, started. Sam. All right, Sam. Now listen. Now Kobe <laughs> said that he would have kneeled if he was playing today. Do you think? And, and, and I know, and that's Kobe. And, and I would be. I would. I be. I would be with Kobe. I would be with Kobe. Right? Oh yeah. Okay. Now, now, do you hey, see Kobe. any players in the NBA today with the money at the level that it is, and Adam Silver coming out and saying, "Hey, man, we gonna stand." Do you see any players? Kneeling this year um, in the NBA, right? Right now, well, this is this is how it is in the NBA. No, no, I'm gonna go one back, one more before that. Uh, uh, Mark, Mark, uh Chris Jackson. Uh oh, Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. He 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 got he got blacklisted or whatever you call it back in the day. Yep, for praying because everybody knew he was. Uh, it has the affirmative of uh, being a, a Muslim. Okay, so take that into consideration. And now today, I mean, the NBA is not as 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 rigid as the N- uh, NFL. But you know, we always stood. There was people. In, there was there's guys who did not come out the tunnel because you it, it, went, it was so unnoticed. Uh, you have people who were like the belief of Jehovah Witness who didn't didn't um, come out right. to, uh, to the flag. So they would stay in the tunnel. And that was okay. Nobody nobody, nobody gave grievance, you know, for, for doing that. So I think that's why I say the, the NBA was more, you know, liberal opposed to the, to the uh, NFL. But now because the NFL has brought this and other people have brought this to light, you know, now they're wondering what if, uh, what the NBA is going to do. Now, wait a minute now. Do we? I'm going to go back to the question, Sam. Will there be a player this year that will kneel in the NBA? No, because they're too young. I'm going to say yes. Wow. I'm going to disagree with you. I, I'm going to say no. Okay, why? Because they're too young. Too young. I because think... cause they, they, it's too, they, they got too much money to, 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 to lose. I mean, it's so much money now to the point where I don't think they understand they may do it in a way, what whatever concept. Like Chris Paul is, they got a they got a uh, a veteran on each team, mm-hmm. and they'll go by that veteran. So if like LeBron had equality on his on his uh, shoe, and they talk about it, they're going to do something in in the neighborhood and in, in their own community. I if think Chris, LeBron will I mean, take a knee. I you do. Think so? I do. I really do. Steph Curry. I do. Steph Curry said the other night that you know we. We made we made our point. We're not going to the White House. Well, so Seth Curry also has a foot from. fetish, so <laughs> yeah, I know. But he—he's he, he, <laughs> stupid. <laughs> he not. He, and they, he they, makes they, shoes they, for forty-year-old white guys. He—he's lights out from three, but he has ugly shoes. <laughs> I also think that that if if white people um, who wrote the anthem and we like to make laws and amendments. I, I think if we all read the entirety of the anthem, particularly the third stanza, maybe uh-huh. we'd have a little bit of a, a clue. Well, they're not. No, they're not. I don't think that's the issue. I don't think that's the issue. I think that's and, and part listen, of it, listen, though. We're listen. talking about systemic, institutionalized racism. And at the beginning of it, that's where it starts. It starts with amendments. It starts with the Constitution that were written for white males. And it's been perpetuated. We still have a national anthem that the third stanza talks about killing slaves. And we want to talk about and wonder why we have athletes taking a knee. The police brutality. It's not about the flag. What? It's not about the anthem. But that's sure part about, of nobody it. Was thinking, no, nobody was thinking about it until Colin Kaepernick, uh, you know, took a knee. And yep. he told him. Yep. He told him why he was taking it. Yep. And then all the, of a sudden. The narrative has changed. He started, started reacting indifferently. So, I mean, I don't think the NBA, I think the guys are too young. I think the guys are too composed in the NBA to 
they, they'll they'll make up something. We always talk about what we're going to do before we do it. We don't want we if one do it, we all do it. And so they'll do something in the communities in the, each community, uh, whatever that wherever they are. But I think the guys, LeBron, you know, LeBron wants to be the spokesman of the of the of the NBA for represent players. So okay, but I think that Carmelo, the Durant, the West Westbrooks. They they not they with Colin, but they do it in their own way. We, with that, we're gonna put a pin on that one, and we're gonna transition. Listen, this is R and R I conversation, and we have former Dallas Maverick, former Los Angeles Laker, former Seattle SuperSonic, former Indiana Pacer, Sam Perkins, <laughs> on the on the mic today. So listen, Sam. You are involved in one of the greatest charities in this country and probably worldwide in the Special Olympics. So with that, uh, we are big fans of Special Olympics yes, at, at, at iConversation. So I wanted to allow JC to kind of engage you in the conversation around what are you doing uh, with Special Olympics and what can we do to be a support? Well, Special Olympics has been like, I've gotten to know Special Olympics way back in college and uh, go back to Dean Smith. He was always telling us or telling me or every time I saw him, he was like, you should get involved in, you know, uh, you know, sponsoring a kid overseas, you know, you know, who need, he was in dire need of clothes, water, shelter, food, whatever. So I had a pen pal at the time and, mm. you know, he, he set it up and he would send money to the, to the pen pal. So, okay. So with that said, uh, Special Olympics came around. We did a, I think we did a clinic or something like that. I can't remember where, but it, uh, I saw people in need, um, saw children that were indifferent, but they were just had, you know, uh, people with uh, intellectual disabilities at the time. Now, I didn't understand it, and but I got to know it because I was doing the clinics, you know, more often each year. When I became a senior, um, I had went traveled to Pennsylvania, uh, no, excuse me, Connecticut, and uh, it was my first time being at a, uh, a kind of a more uh, worldwide or citywide um, sports uh, arena that hosted uh, intellect- intellectual or special Olympic games. All right. And um, so I was, I was probably about, I say about eleven, twelve years old, and I had a friend who could run as, he can run as faster than a jet. I mean, he would, every time we would run on the block, he would always beat me. I didn't understand why this kid could always beat me. Well, we separated a little bit, and uh, we went out diff- different ways. So that, that Connecticut trip where I went to see the Special Olympics, the first time I seen him was at the Special Olympics. Uh-huh. I didn't know he was had, had intellectual disability. And he didn't tell me, and I should have known. I, I mean, things that that should gave it away was like he he we worked together, and childhood friend. We he lived around the corner in Brooklyn, and we had a we had a uh, we worked together as a like teenage. They had like a a, a program for teenagers to to work for the summer, and nice. we worked together. So he wanted all ones. You know, everything was ones. Uh, he never didn't want tens. He never wanted fives when it came to cash his check. So I had to, you know, go with him. And he asked me to go to the bank. And can you ask to tell the lady can I can get like two hundred, you know, four hundred ones? And uh, I said, we well, gonna be here all day, man. Yeah. He says, I, I just don't understand. I just did not understand why he wanted four hundred ones. Yep. So I went up there and said to the lady, can I get four hundred ones? She looked at me like I was crazy. Absolutely. So, so, I so the next thing I know, uh, he got his four hundred ones. Never knew that. But the reason why I explain that is because he he had a disability. And the first time I saw him again was in like like ten, you know, six years later at a at a Special Olympic uh, program, and he ran track, and that's why he always beat me because he was a, he was a sprinter, and did not know that for the longest. So um, that's when I got to know Special Olympics a great deal, and um, and I went into uh, went to they they heard about my um, work and all the things I was doing, so they invited me to a, uh, a world game in Shanghai and things of that nature, and they saw me you know act, you know 
among the, the, the athletes. And they, they saw me, you know, being passionate with them. I didn't, I wasn't scared of them. I wasn't treating them differently. I was just treating them just like me and you, right. you know, treat each other. So next thing I know, I'm on the board and I've been on the board for now seven years and uh, now chairman of the sports committee. And so I advocate and talk about them all the time. And I talk about my young man and the man that I, I grew up with, they actually know him as well. Aww. And, um, so the thing is, is that it's a it's a it's a it's an organization that just cares about intellectual people with intellectual disabilities, motor skills, autism, things of that nature. And I go I go cross countries. I went to from Morocco to to Dubai to uh, Spokane to we just came from a place called Austria and a place called Schladming, and they have the Winter Games. Wow. And then we have summer games not too long ago in um, Los Angeles. So I've been an advocate for them for, for years. And it's, it's just, you know, I speak for people that don't have a voice. But it's, it's matured and it's progressed a lot to the point where Special Olympics is now in the forefront. It's finally made the mainstream. We're still not satisfied. But the point is that people know more about Special Olympics. And, and, you, and time goes on, you find out more people who have, have a child or have a person or have a relative that has uh, an intellectual disability. And, and they would never come out and say that before, but now that you see people come out because they thought that if you had a child, and still in, in countries, they still shun, they Absolutely. still hide their kids, they still chain, they still chain their, their uh, kids and loved ones to fences because yep. they're indifferent. Uh, you have people in Pakistan and places in rural areas who put, you know, attach suicide bombs to them and go wow. into a crowd and blow them up because yeah. of their belief. So, wow. you know, you still have that type of mentality, but as you get to further to the West, um, you find out that, you know, parents and, and, and volunteers and people who, who advocate, advocates of, of Special Olympics, we try to include them in the society like we, like we, like we, we, we do every day. So yeah. it's been a passion of mine. I, you know, I, I speak for them all the time. And uh, there's almost like 4.1 million athletes uh, with disabilities and they all family to me. So I, I you know, we, we, get together, we get together, we have, we have intellectual, matter of fact, we have board members who have a disability, intellectual disability. So, and they're, and we're, we're bringing them to the forefront because we want them to be speaking just like us and letting them know that they're just not limited or let let people sh uh, show people that they're not limited just to to confine to a wheelchair or confine to a different world because now they work in society they work in uh, they work in um, grocery stores they, they get married now they live on their own they have Fantastic. they have reality TV now yep. you know? yeah. so we do it's coming it's, it's coming more and more prevalent and so people can have the awareness well, you can tell, listeners, that Sam Perkins goes hard for the Special Olympics. Listen, Sam, it's been an amazing show, an amazing time being spent with you. As we ask everybody, will you please come back? If you got something going on that you need to let our listeners know about, would you please come back and, and, and spend some time with us over here, over here at R&R &R Conversation? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to got one more thing. Though. Okay, go ahead. Um, as, far, as far as Kappa concerned, we... Uh, you know, my fraternity, uh, yep. the Kappa Alpha fraternity, we're having a diamond ball ourselves uh, in December. Okay. And uh, we're having uh, Cedric the Entertainer. He's a nice. noob as well. You know? Right. So all these people that we just talked about are, are noobs. I wonder why they are. They know they know. Achieve they me, they baby. Know they, <laughs> they, know they, they know why they are. So, But the thing is that we're having him December 14th in Fort Worth, Texas. So, you know, you can go to Fort Worth's uh, 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 website. And it's Fort Worth Cappers dot dot org, and uh, you'll see you'll see us up there, and uh, try to donate. Just you Fantastic. know, whatever cause it is, uh, absolutely. We, we 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 work with young men, um, in Special Olympics. We we work with uh, intellectual disabilities, old and young. So, if people are listening, you know, if you have time, to, you know, just check out in your own in your own area, own city, state. And check out some of the things that uh, Special Olympics are doing and uh, Fort Worth and, and Cappers and Noops. They're all over, just just like uh, just like uh, what you say, ants. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, well, everybody got everybody got an ant problem. So there you go. 
<laughs> uh, I'm going to give you the Dikembe Mutombo finger wave on that because I do not have an ant problem. <laughs> My house. Well, then you will. Then you will. <laughs> Sam, thank you for uh, coming to visit us. And uh, we look forward to the next time. But listen, everybody, you go out and support Special Olympics. Look for your chapter in your city. And then if you get an opportunity to head toward Dallas, Fort Worth in December, make sure you check out the uh, Fort Worth uh, Cap Alpha Psi alumni chapter and uh, spend some time with them and uh, check out their diamond ball. Thank you for checking us out. And uh, we look forward to next time. More Eye Conversation next on the Kazookian Network. And we're back with r and Eye Conversation. We just wrapped it up with Sam Perkins. Who Big went Smooth. In. Big, Big smooth. smooth. You know what? We should have asked him about Big Smooth or Sleepy Sam. I think Which he one? likes Big Smooth. <laughs> I prefer, I mean, if you're going to give me a nickname, I would much rather be Big Smooth than Sleepy Sam. What do you think about Sam? What do you think about his comments? What I, stood out to you? I think that he really has put thought into what he wanted to say and I love that his love well not love of Special Olympics but that his first introduction to Special Olympics was through a childhood friend because that's that's where it starts you can't hate somebody once you meet them and everybody has differences Um, you know special needs people are often spotted by physical disabilities or apparent intellectual disabilities and there's stigma that goes along with that and realizing that we're people too let me ask you this As as a mother of an autistic child how do you deal with you know when you hear a person like Sam Perkins I'm sure it gives you it makes you warm on the inside of course and I see also on social media you actually talk a lot about having an autistic child yeah what kind of things do you think we need to do as a society to help those with with special needs it starts with the most simple thing and that's what Sam Perkins did he was a friend and he didn't know that the kid, he knew, probably knew something was wrong, obviously, you know, $401 bills. That's right. probably a good classic autism sign. Right. He was just the kid's friend and he helped him out. And if you, and I think this is a life lesson for any walk of life, any person. If you meet someone with an open heart, wow. that's really where it starts. That's all I want for my son because my son. Uh, is a beautiful kid who has difficulty making and maintaining friendships. And right. friendships are integral to life. Right. But also, there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot that, that goes away and melts away when you meet a person just as a person. Yeah. And, you know, and, and it kind of lends us to this whole issue around race and sports and that, mm-hmm. and that you know, literally... I think a lot of people just don't have a friend that's someone that 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 looks different from them, right? Or, or but they have do. different are different beliefs than they do, right? And and start to look at them from the humanistic right. side of uh, of who they are. And I think if you do that, if you look at them as another human being just like you, and because underneath we're all the same. Yep. If we just look each other at the, each other from that perspective, I believe that we will be able to eliminate some of the problems that we're having in this society. We've had so many natural disasters occur with flooding and with hurricane season going on. And you see all these stories of people and their humanity helping each other. And that's because when you meet people on equal ground with nothing, hate goes away. Yeah, well, you know, I care less about uh, your skin color if you're pulling me out of uh, out of a flooding environment. Right. <laughs> you know, well, if you're so, coming, by, people, if you're coming by on the boat, I bet you you don't care what color that person is. No, but if, some of these folks want to take their Confederate flags with them. So, <laughs> you know, kudos to those that rescue anyway. Well, listen, we want to thank Sam Perkins for an amazing Absolutely. interview. We want to thank you for continuing to listen to r and our Eye Conversation. So listen, we'll be back same bat channel same bat time next week so uh we'll be back with more 
great conversations from some of these sports icons on iConversation. Take care. iConversation. Executive producer Larry Robinson. Produced at Kazookian Studios in Memphis, Tennessee. iConversation. Part of the Kazookian Network. 